Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we have a really exciting topic and set of panelists today to talk about a very important uh, issue uh, that's been going on for a long time. It involves uh, uh, AI, algorithms, privacy, where these things intersect, uh, and that is uh, privacy in the employment context and decisions that are being made about people in an automated fashion in the employment context. Uh, so um, uh, we have with us today um, uh, really an, an amazing group of scholars uh, and thinkers who have uh, been uh, looking into these issues for quite a long time. Um, and so uh, with us and the inspiration for our, our talk uh, is uh, Ifama Ajua, uh, who uh, is a now a professor at Emory Law School. Uh, she uh, has had a long career looking at issues about AI in employment. Um, her latest book, which is uh, very recently published, uh, and I want to do a big plug for this book, The Quantified Worker. Uh, this really is a tour de force on uh, the new technologies being used to analyze workers, hire workers, uh, you know, examine every facet of their lives. What's going on is quite uh, quite amazing and quite dramatic and uh, quite eye-opening. And uh Ifama is going to talk a little bit about this when we, we, we get rolling about what is going on. Uh, but the book also has a lot of information about what the law does and doesn't do, about what the problems are. Um, this is really just a fantastic book. And I urge everyone interested in this issue uh, to run out and grab a copy because this, this, is, this is great. Um, we also have with us uh, Pauline Kim. Uh, who is a uh, professor at Washington University School of Law. Uh, she has been writing about uh, employment, privacy, and AI issues uh, for quite a long time, really blazing a trail on these issues. Her work is uh, fantastic, and uh, I'm so glad that she's here to join us. Uh, and we also have uh, Matt Bodie. Uh, from University of Minnesota Law School. Um, he also has been writing about these issues for a very, very long time, uh, is one of the leading experts in this area. Um, so I, I really just couldn't be more excited to have uh, this panel um, of uh, really the leaders in this field to, to tackle these very complicated issues. So to start, I, I'd like to uh, ask you, Afama, um, to uh, tell us about your book, tell us about what is happening. Uh, what does the landscape look like? What is being done? Uh, what what kind of inspired you to, to, to write this book? Um, so first, thank you so much, uh, you know, Dan, for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, it is such an honor and a privilege um, to share the space with you and with Pauline and with Matt. Um, you know, a lot of my book was informed by the research that Pauline and Matt were uh, really the pioneers of um, looking at the automated decision making in the workplace. So it's truly a delight and an honor to be sharing a stage with them. Um, as to what led to the book, the book actually was sort of a, an offshoot of my dissertation research when I was a graduate student at Columbia University. I was interviewing formerly incarcerated men and women um, who were trying to re-enter the workforce. And these men and women, you know, many of whom had been in prison for quite some time, were very eager to rejoin society. They were very dedicated and committed to doing the work needed to do so but they found that they kept running into essentially um, a stone wall uh, when it came to reentering the workforce. And in interviewing them, that's really when I first learned about automated hiring systems and how automated hiring systems can actually be used as culling systems that can actually prevent certain groups of people from ever even getting an interview. 
Uh, so once I interviewed them and I found out that problem, this led me to really consider the use of AI technologies or automated decision-making technologies in the workplace in so many different areas. Um, I think there's a lot of attention that's paid to the idea that AI technologies might um, replace workers. You know, the idea of automation is often seen as a replacement. But I think we also want to think about the fact that currently humans are having to deal with AI technologies in the workplace and that this is changing the experience of, of work. It is changing access to work and it's even changing um, the bargain, the employment bargain in terms of what workers are being called to give up. Um, in terms of their data. So for me, I see this really as a phenomenon where AI technologies or automated decision-making technologies are enabling the quantification of the worker. So it seems like gone are the days where a worker is seen as like a whole human being and more now it's more let's break the, the worker down into numbers, right? And those numbers can include things like, um, you know, years of employment, too much, too many, right? Um, education, uh, the right kind, uh, you know, and it can become a binary, the right kind versus the wrong kind. And there's no nuance, right? Um, so I think this quantification of the worker, while not new, right? It's, it's always happened, workers have always, had to show qualification. But right now, the quantification of the worker is to a degree and in a manner that we haven't really seen before in history. And that is because of the introduction of AI technologies. So Pauline and, and Matt, I was wondering if, if you have anything uh, to add uh, to just the, the trend of, of, of what's happening uh, what are uh, employers doing? Uh, what are some of the technologies and techniques that they're 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 turning to? Do you want to jump in, uh, Pauline? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll jump in. I think um, you probably did a great job of kind of laying out the, the the framework. There's a lot of detail in the book, which really goes into the different kinds of technologies that are being used now. And, and I think that um, there are a couple important points in what she said, right? This is not new. Um, one of the things the book does very nicely is takes us all the way back to the Industrial Revolution and in the early 20th century, sort of Taylor's theories of management. Uh, but what's really different now is that the um, amount of data that's available and the the computing tools that are available have really just raised uh, this phenomenon in terms of the scale at which it can occur and the efficiency with which it can, can occur. So while many of the concepts aren't really new and have this continuity to past work management practices, in some ways we really are in a different world now um, mm -hmm. because of how extensive this technology is throughout all different parts of the workplace. And I do think it's really, um, as we found said, it's just affecting so many different parts um, of the work relationship. Matt, do you have any thoughts? I, I would just add that um, it's really impressive. Um, I know um, uh, you've been doing it for a long time, Bowen, but um, you are, you know, earlier in your career than Pauline and I, and this book is just so impressive. It's um, Thank you. Uh, really a great work. Um, um, I, 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 when I first heard about it, I'm like, ooh, I'm really excited for this book. And then when I got it, I'm like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is even more than I was expecting. Thank you. Um, uh, and you're, um, I, I will give a shout out to you and your editor, Matt Galloway, because he's someone that I've worked with as well. Mm -hmm. And so to have so many um, graphics, um, so many figures. <laughs> I fought for the graphics. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And that, that's why I think, I think if you're a practitioner, right, as an academic, obviously, I'm really impressed with the book and the, um, as the way, as Pauline said, you go all the way back to Taylorism and Ford's sociological department and kind of draw that forward. Um, but as a practitioner, there's just so much in here about how these practices are happening, what the concerns are, um, how many ways you can, um, and again, this is where you build on Pauline's great work about discriminatory algorithms, you know, how many ways an algorithm might seem to be neutral or non-discriminatory, but 
you know, that discrimination seeps in. Um, and I just think you document that really well. So if, if you're working in this area, either in the privacy side or in the human resources, uh, labor and employment side, I think this is a really, a, a really important book for you to get your hands on because you can really understand a lot more about what's going on kind of across the board, uh, particularly in that middle section of the book where you have chapters on each of the types of um, uses of data, um, the different techniques that are being used uh, to interview employees, to you know uh, document their past history, to evaluate them for promotions or for hiring. Um, it's just in incredibly well done. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to delve in to some of the issues. And, and uh, one major issue is the use of algorithms in hiring. Uh, and it, it's kind of shocking just how extensively algorithms are being used to hire people through resume screening that you talk about in your book, as well mm -hmm. as this even even uh, video interviewing uh, where people are, are being analyzed by AI, uh, you know, and and not even by a human, uh, but just talking to a video and, and, and then, uh, you know, every movement. Uh, being uh, scrutinized uh, and uh, wanted to talk about the, uh, I think one of the major issues about this is uh, bias and discrimination. Uh, and one thing that you you note, Ifama, is that, you know, what, what sort of you call almost a paradox is that a, a lot of these, uh, you know, some of the motivations from the algorithms, besides efficiency, which I think is the biggest, you know, cheaper and easier, um, but also there, there's a motive that, that this is going to be less biased than humans. Uh, humans are biased already, and, and we know that their decision-making process is opaque. Uh, so the thought is that these algorithms are, are gonna be better. Uh, but as you point out, that's not necessarily so. Um, I'd love to talk about that. Wh wh why not? And, and, and why aren't these, uh, an improvement on the, you know, often very bad track record that humans have yeah. in making these decisions? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Dan. And um, I think researching, you know, automated hiring systems was really eye-opening for me because, you know, prior to that, if you had asked me, I would have said, oh, you know, um, submitting your application online perhaps might be less biased or, you know, less prone to discrimination than um, potentially going into, uh, you know, a store and meeting with a human manager who may or may not like the looks of you, for, for example. Um, but the research actually showed otherwise, right? Because with automated hiring, you actually have more opportunities for discrimination in a very subtle, uh, insidious, hidden way, um, because you can use, you um, variables that are actually proxy variables uh, for forbidding characteristics. And this can be something then that's repeated, um, you know, at scale. It's like, it's magnified. It doesn't have to be just one human manager who's, you know, biased or discriminatory. It can be the automated hiring system that's programmed for the entire firm. And then therefore everyone is subject to the same biases, right? So that was really eye-opening for me. Um, but yes, I think you're right. What I also encountered was a lot of corporations touting um, turning to automated hiring systems as a way to reduce bias, because that's really how the vendors uh, market them. Those are the claims that are made that automated hiring systems somehow are just inherently less biased than humans. And so there's this sort of like binary of pitting automated hiring systems against human managers. And guess what? You know, all humans have biases and then somehow automated hiring systems don't have any biases. Uh, and of course, that's just not true, right? Because automated hiring systems are still being created by humans. And the automated hiring systems are basically inheriting the biases of whoever created them and also whoever trained them. Because then first is a creation, and then there's also the way you train those systems. So, you know, paradoxically, right, automated hiring systems then, then can actually have more potential for bias 
because you can train them in a way where they are discreetly biased, right? Um, where the discrimination is hidden. Um, and, you know, just to give a concrete example, uh, a lot of automated hiring systems allow for the use of zip codes as a way to call applications, as a way to say, okay, this person lives in a zip code that is not preferred. Um, and, you know, you can give innocuous reasons for preferring certain zip codes over others. So you can say, oh, these zip codes are closer to work. So we prefer them because then the person doesn't have a long commute, et cetera, right? That seems innocuous enough. But the problem is zip codes in America are not neutral, right? With the history of residential segregation in the U.S., zip codes actually have a racial, um, a racial significance. Um, certain zip codes are predominantly white. Certain zip codes can be predominantly minority. Um, so the use of zip codes then can actually have a racial effect. Um, but of course, you know, corporations can say, oh, we're not discriminating on the basis of race, right? We just happen to choose a variable that has the same effect. So I think in, though, in that way, you know, automated hiring system is dangerous. Uh, automated hiring system is pernicious, is insidious in the way that it can allow for discrimination. Pauline, uh, very curious to hear your, your take on this. You've been uh, focused on workplace discrimination uh, you know, for as long as, as I, I can remember, decades now. Um, how have these trends evolved and, and kind of where are we today? And, and, and what is the, 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 the nature of the problem? Um, so I think what Ethan was said really kind of captures it. Um, I think I might have a slightly different emphasis, although I'm not really disagreeing with anything that she said. Um, you know, on the on the one side, and, and I, maybe I can start by giving a little bit of um, sort of my own route to this study of um, algorithmic systems, as I have been thinking about and writing about discrimination and privacy in the workplace for a while. And then I realized, boy, this technology is going to have a huge impact in both of those areas and something that really needs more attention and, and um, needs um, more systematic thinking and also attention brought to it. But one of the really um, classic field studies in the area of employment discrimination involved the, uh, some economists who sent out a whole bunch of resumes that were matched. So the, the credentials were identical, but they were matched so that one resume would have an African-American affiliated name and the other would have one that sort of was a white sounding name. And they sent these out in pairs. And what they found was that um, the white sounding names, these were all fictional applicants, got more callbacks, right? And that was a really clear, this was, this was done a couple decades ago, and that was at a time when there were human managers reviewing the, the applications. And that was a really clear signal that there was systematic bias going on in our hiring system, right? This was a matter of significant concern, even though employers would disclaim that that was going on. So it's sort of understandable that when the technology emerged that created the possibility that employers could start doing some screening, but in doing that screening, they could say, you know, block access to the name so that you couldn't see racially identified names and force the decision to be made based on the credentials and not some ethnic affiliation with the name. That seemed like it would really be an advance. And I do think it has the potential that these tools do have the potential for removing some of these sources of human bias. And so I think that that's important to keep in mind that there is that potential upside to it. I think the real danger, as Ethan said, is that people assume that the technology is therefore neutral and objective. And it isn't necessarily right. And it's really important uh, to constantly be interrogating the technology to see what it is that they're doing, what it's doing. Now, um, when I first started talking about this issue, a lot of people would say, well, isn't there a really easy response? Why don't you just not let the software have access to information like race or gender or age. And then the software wouldn't be able to discriminate on those bases. But as I film explained, right, there are often proxies um, in the data for these different characteristics, and that can be a basis for discrimination. 
Um, I do think that sometimes maybe corporations know what's going on and they're perfectly happy with the results if they use the code as a criterion. But I actually think more often or perhaps an even greater risk is a company that is approached by a vendor who says, hey, I can automate your hiring process. I can save you lots of time and money. All you have to do is just implement this software and the company goes ahead and does it. Maybe not intending to discriminate, maybe actually wanting to diversify the workforce, but they're actually being sold a tool that because of the way it was built has these sort of biases um, implicit in them. And so uh, a lot of the challenge, I think, is, is really educating employers about the risks and helping them to figure out how to ask hard questions, how to really test the software, make sure that it's doing what they're good, they want it to do, both in terms of their own goals for diversifying their work, workforce and also their own goals in terms of staying out of legal trouble. Matt, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, I would just um, echo what Ifoma and Pauline have said. Um, there are just so many, I see one of the comments was what other factors might come into play. And they literally could be so many different factors um, that are infused with racial bias um, uh, or other types of discrimination, right? The book also talks about the ADA and personality tests um, and um, facial recognition, the role that, you know, certain types of uh, disabilities might have in, you know, kind of, you know, judging people based on, you know, eye contact or things like that, where there might be a, a disability in play that might very well lead them to score poorly, but it wouldn't really have much of an effect on their job performance, particularly with accommodations that are appropriate. So um, uh, I think, I think the real problem is what Pauline was saying that there are a lot of people who will be like, well, this will solve my problem, right? I will just, these people seem really smart. They, they have this algorithm and I don't understand how it works, but I just, boop, 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 I just plug in, you know, these resumes and these candidates and, you know, maybe I have uh, like 300 people or, you know, even like for a small company, 30 resumes might be a lot to go through. You know, I'll just, I'll trust the algorithm. And I think that's what's really frightening. And that's what this book is a really great counter to. And I, I also really appreciated that if almost a chapter on, you know, addressing this, it doesn't just single out the employer or these third party vendors. She takes on both of them and says that they both have to have responsibility, um, that you can't just let the employer off the hook and say, well, you know, you didn't really know what was going on. You know, the employer has a responsibility to make sure that they're used appropriately. Um, and the third party vendor can't just say, well, you know, we're not making any of these decisions. We're just helping out. You know, they have to have responsibility as well. So. One, one challenge with all this is that, um, you know, it, 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 as Pauline mentioned, you, you know, the and, and, and informa, you know, the input data, um, you can't just easily figure out what to exclude. Uh, so we could exclude data about uh, about race and race and ethnicity and gender, but but that's not enough, you know, zip codes. But then there's also um, other data uh, that is harder to figure out how to limit or or restrict. Uh, and and you talk about the uh, you know very now now infamous uh, attempt by Amazon.com to try to uh, you know, use an algorithm to hire people. Uh, the algorithm looked at, you know, which uh, current employees were the most successful uh, and to mimic those hires. Uh, that led to discrimination against women because the historical data was focused, uh, was male to, based on male discrimination in favor of males. Um, and that ultimately, you know, the algorithm is going to find things in the data. It's going to look and discover patterns that might not have people uh, might not have been aware of. Now, you know, that, that seems obvious now in hindsight, but there's also going to be a lot of things that are not going to be obvious that we're not going to know. We're not going to know, you know, the things that correlate, things that could be proxies, but the algorithms are going to ferret this out and are going to ultimately uh, do this. So if we're relying on past data, and that past data is data from a society that uh, has a long history of discrimination, um, is it possible to, to find a process that somehow 
cures it or, or, or cleanses that out? Or is it just impossible that the, the, the very premise of the algorithm is, uh, of, of looking to the past to somehow project a future that just can't work? Uh, and it's doomed, or, or is there a way to do it? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering, like, what 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 can be done? Is is, is there a? Because I think there's a lot of promise. I think you know, it's absolutely true, and, and I think everyone says, yeah, these these algorithms are so much promise. They could do so much, um, but I wonder. You know, it, it seems a lot harder uh, than you know than we might imagine. Yeah, I, I think you touch upon an important point there, um, you know, Dan. And, you know, s definitely several AI and law scholars like Sandra Mason, for example, have made this point that essentially when you're using past data to make predictions for the future, um, you're inheriting the historical biases, right, that led to those past data collection. Um, because, you know, we, we tend to think like data is objective, you know, data is neutral. But the fact is there were decisions made when that data was being created or even collected that impacts that what that data is. So if you're using past data to make future predictions, you're basically replicating those same decisions in perpetuity. Um, and those decisions can be racist, they can be sexist, they can be other type of types of discriminatory. And the question is, how, how do you solve for this? Um, so somebody like Anupam Chander has offered his solution, which is um, algorithmic um, affirmative action, right? Um, where you're basically correcting the data before you use it to train your algorithm. So for example, with the case of Amazon, right? They use their top performing data, but the problem was because of historical decisions they had made to hire mostly men, right? Then their top performing data reflected mostly men. And this then led to the algorithm or the system you know, sort of learning this idea that, oh, you like male candidates, so I am going to bring you more male candidates. So in that situation, I think Anupam would offer that when training that system, instead of just using your top performing uh, uh, people, if you look at your top performing data and you see that they're all men, then you might want to correct it by adding some women who are close to top performing or who you think could be top performing and in such a way you would correct the data. So that's one solution, I think. Um, I think another solution is really something that I think both Pauline and I have advocated for, which is this idea of audits. Um, so I just think you can never really know what the problem is a lot of times, or at least the full picture of the problem beforehand. Um, and so you audit before you implement the system, also um, referred to as certification, but then you also audit after you've implemented the system, just to see if somehow the variables you're using inadvertently are proxy variables, because your audits will show you if you're excluding large swaths of people. Now, to be able to audit, you have to design your system to allow for it. And I think that's really a big um, intervention point, right? Because currently automated hiring systems are not being explicitly, explicitly designed for regular audits. Um, a lot of automated hiring systems, for example, do not retain records of failed applications, right? So a lot of times you apply in an automated hiring system, some people are red lighted, so they're, you know, basically dismissed. Some people are yellow lighted, meaning, you know, they're marked as maybe, and then other people are green lighted, meaning they move on to the next stage. Oftentimes, I think generally, the red lighted people never show up. It's like that data is gone. Um, and I think that would make it difficult to have a true real audit of, you know, who are all the people that apply? What's your actual true pool of candidates and how did you sort them out? So I would start there, frankly. I would um, argue for a federal mandate about how 
automated hiring systems are designed. Um, and that would be to include the retention of data that could then be used for audits. Yeah, I, I think one, you know, a couple challenges is we're trying to think now about, you know, how, how what can the law do here? Um, how does the law protect and how does it not protect? Uh, and some problems, you know, the law actually can do something uh, you, you talk about, um, you know, personality testing, for example, and how the ADA could, in fact, uh, you know, be a tool that that could you know, address some of the problems there. Um, but some of the other problems might need a, a change in the law. And uh, I also worry a little bit too about um, if if we focus on rooting out, you know, traditional forms of discrimination. Um, won't the algorithms find new forms of discrimination? So it might say, look, you know, short people, um, which isn't a category, but, you know, people, the studies have shown, you know, taller people have a, a, an advantage. Or, you know, it could be, you know, certain uh, decisions about, you know, you know, bald people, you know, mm -hmm. like like me, um, you know, could be, just, you know, and I'd say, well, look, you know, it, it could be, you know, things that, you know, people have no control over, or choices that people make based on, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, the way they want to live their life that we want to provide freedom for. But the algorithms might, you know, come up with uh, uh, patterns uh, that, that show discrimination on these other grounds. Uh, but in a sense, we're always going to, you know, you have to use some factors to make, you know, decisions about people or comparisons about people. Um, uh, uh, you know, figuring out like how, how far do we go down down the road to trying to create what's truly a, a fair system, uh, looking at what's really most relevant for hiring, uh, and that treats everyone you know in a way that that that's fair, uh, and, and it seems like we're very, we're so far off um, from from that from that goal, and it it, it it's. You know, algorithms might eventually, you know, even if perfected, might just substitute one form of discrimination for another form of discrimination uh, that ultimately down the road will say, well, wait, we, we, we want to also ferret out. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll stop there. And, and uh, Pauline, what are your thoughts? Well, so I had some thoughts in terms of, you know, what are the possibilities for getting algorithms to do this right, to get rid of some of the bias, right? And and you know the big problem, as you pointed out, Dan, is that um, we don't live in an unbiased world, right? We live in a world that has reflects a lot of past prejudice and discrimination, and so that those patterns are reflected in the data. But what really matters is the people who are designing the algorithms. How are they defining the problem and trying to solve it? So if they you know, in the employment context, what the employer really wants is to identify applicants who will be good employees. That's a, you know, that's a completely legitimate goal, right? But if they try to do that by saying, okay, well, we're going to figure out who we're going to hire by figuring out who we've hired in the past, who looks the most like who we've hired in the past, mm -hmm. that's what's going to allow discriminatory patterns to repeat themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're just really, the you're just basically telling the machine to replicate your current workforce with whatever biases and discrimination, discriminatory decisions went into shaping that workforce. So what I think really matters is thinking about how we are defining the problem that we want the algorithm to solve. So if, for example, the employer said, it is really critical that people have X, Y, and Z skills and found ways to test for that directly, that actually might allow opportunities for people who don't have traditional credentials, didn't go to fancy colleges, um, but can actually demonstrate that they have these skills to get into these positions. So I'm not completely, um, I don't feel completely hopeless <laughs> about this. Um, I think we always have to be very careful that um, past discriminatory patterns aren't being fed into these algorithms. But at the same time, with a lot of careful attention to how the problem is being defined, the target that you're trying to predict, and what data you're using to predict it, I do think there is a, a anti-discriminatory possibility, um, but it requires a lot of care and it often requires more work than just pulling down some available data set and, and, and building um, a model 
off of that. Um, I wanted to go back to one thing that Ifoma mentioned earlier about Anupam Chandra's um, really interesting article about recognizing that there are um, discriminatory patterns that can be repeated um, if we use um, biased data to build algorithms. And he uses the term um, algorithmic affirmative action. And I just wanted to add a note of caution there as we are this week awaiting a decision from the Supreme Court that many people think will strike down affirmative action in higher education. That what Anupam Chander is suggesting and something that I've written about in my other work, um, that a lot of these kinds of strategies for de-biasing algorithms are not the same thing as affirmative action in higher education, which may be on its last legs, that they are conceptually distinct and they should be treated as legally distinct. So regardless of whatever the Supreme Court decides this week about Harvard and North Carolina's admissions programs, the argument that in the algorithmic, algorithmic context, employers, developers, other entities that use these algorithms should be taking steps to make sure that they are not biased, shouldn't be affected by that, whatever that decision is. So I just wanted to, since we're sort of sitting here in the shadow of that decision, uh, looming in the next few days, I, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah. Ifoma, go ahead. You wanted to. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I realize Matt might have something to say, but I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Pauline, for um, that making that fine point. I think it was very necessary, especially given the environment and um, time <laughs> that we're living in. Um, I think it's also important to understand that there's also um, other legal backing for um, what Anupam Chander suggests um, doing. So um, professors um, uh, post, um, um, uh, Professor uh, Robert Ford Johnson, uh, Thompson, sorry, have written about something called an affirmative duty of care uh, by employers. And what they mean by that is that Title VII, which is an anti-discriminatory anti statute, actually imposes an affirmative duty of care on employers to avoid discrimination. So it's not enough just to say, oh, I just used this data and I didn't really check it to make sure, right? Um, according to those professors, to be in line with Title VII, employers actually need to take care that they're using data that's not going to lead to more discrimination. So I write about this in, in my article and, and in the book as well. Um, and then um, I just also wanted to, um, I guess, point to something, a comment that people made in the comments, which is how do you um, rectify this issue? You know, we've talked about design elements that can happen and, you know, legal elements. Um, but we also want to talk about the people. And, you know, one comment was in designing the algorithms, wouldn't it help to have a more diverse set of developers? And I think that's something that we encounter, right, when we're dealing with AI systems in that there can be blind spots, right, with people creating them where they might not necessarily be intending to be discriminatory, but because of their limited life experience, they're choosing um, criteria or they're choosing variables that are then inadvertently discriminatory. So having a, you know, a more diverse group of developers or even um, having uh, testing done by the developers where they bring in like uh, a more diverse uh, testing group could help, I think, as well. So one one thing that um, I think is is going to be a challenge and a little bit of pessimism here is that employers are turning to algorithms. I think not primarily for the the sort of laudable reason of we want to uh, end discrimination in our workforce. I think their main purpose, and this may be a good secondary, the main purpose is efficiency. We want something easier and cheaper. Uh, we want to save costs. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of time and effort to do this. So we want to automate. And from the comments here, which I think are right, you know, it's not so easy. Uh, it looks easy. It looks like an easy button, but there's no free lunch. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it, it's going to take a lot of work to do this right. Uh, which 
will counteract the great benefit that the employers really want to do, which is I, they want something cheap and easy. And so there's always going to be that tension where, you know, maybe a few will say, yeah, we're going to go down this hard road. Uh, but a lot will want something quick and easy, which I think then uh, means that the only way to get this done is for the law to step in and say that there are, you know, certain duties and obligations uh, in the hiring process uh, that you can't really uh, have it that easy. Uh, and ultimately I think the law might need to, to do that uh, because I'm not sure the market, you know, of, of, and, and good intentions are, are going to do it alone. Uh, it's something the law is going to have to force onto it and, and shut down this, this kind of easy avenue that employers are, are taking. Um, uh, Matt, I was curious what, what your thoughts are on, on uh, just generally and, and, and generally just for, for automation, um, uh, you, how should we regulate this and, and, you know, what, uh, what kind of um, legal framework do you think could could uh, best ad address some of these problems? And also, I want to keep in mind too that that you know, if it gets too expensive and too difficult, and we ask so much, you know, we're going to have a lot of pushback by corporations saying, "Hey, you know, we you're 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 you're." raising our costs too much for hiring, you're making it too hard and, and they're going to have a lot of resistance, but maybe, maybe we should still go down that path. Right. Right. And, and you're also seeing the argument, well, we need to be able to innovate. We need to be nimble. We need to, you know, I think one of the promises of this area kind of along the lines of what Pauline was saying was maybe we'll find some factors, you know, that are, you know, uniquely spread across the population, but are unappreciated that really show that a lot of people who could be doing certain types of work are not just because they're not, those those talents aren't appreciated, right? Because we have certain stereotypes about what types of people do what kinds of work. Um, but I think as the book actually, you know, well documents and has some really great ideas about managing, you know, there are huge privacy issues, right? When you start digging around in people's, you know, resumes and backgrounds and, you know, monitoring their sleep, there's some great work on uh, health data and wellness uh, programs. Um, you know, I've often wondered, you know, when law school deans are going to start monitoring professors' sleep to see if they do <laughs> do a better job, you know, after they've had eight hours or so uh, versus, you know, or maybe we'll have like caffeine stations uh, that are, you know, um, encouraged. And I'm sure now that I, I doubt many law professors need encouragement to, to, to have a cup of coffee. But, um, uh, but no, but I'm, there, there's just a lot of possibility out there. And I think the book also really examines these types of, you know, surveillance issues. Uh, monitoring of, of health data. And I, I think the book recognizes, right, something that Afoma says, and, you know, there are some circumstances in which it will help workers, right? If you look in sports, right, there are certain leagues that say we want more data about what we're doing because, you know, we feel like we're not getting the same type of analysis that can make us better athletes um, and could maybe give us a better chance to, to do our jobs at a higher level. Um, but you compare that with, you know, the invasiveness of a lot of this monitoring and some of it does seem just kind of, you know, because the employer can, we're going to collect that data and, you know, maybe we'll figure out something to do with it later. Um, so I think one of the really interesting proposals that the book has is this idea of concurrent regulation, which is the idea that you want to have a lot of different kind of ways of looking at and attacking the problem. I think, I think a lot of U.S. privacy scholars have like GDPR envy, right? We kind of like want to have like the big blanket, you know, that does everything. And so I'm wondering if I'm what you think in terms of, you know, like the desire for one big system versus your idea of concurrent regulation. Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I'll, I guess I'll start with a caveat, which is that I'm not a GDPR expert by any means. Um, but from what I can see, you know, GDPR has proven to be sort of cumbersome, let's put it that way, um, you know, in terms of uh, implementation and enforcement, et cetera. So, so there are some drawbacks, right, to having that type of omnibus type law 
there, there are huge drawbacks. And especially for our system, right? We, we, are, we have a federalist system and, you know, all states want to retain their little piece of sovereignty. I, th I think it's going to be really difficult. Um, but that being said, I think it is also important to think about, do we, do we want piecemeal legislation where you as a worker in California, you have more rights than a worker in, um, you know, let's say uh, Texas. Um, it, it, that doesn't seem fair that you're both Americans, right? But somebody has more rights than you. So, so I do, I do think we want some type of uniformity. Um, but I, I do think we also want to be sensitive to the fact that maybe different um, sectors in terms of work sectors might require different things. You know, let's take, for example, worker surveillance, which is something we haven't really dug into, but I talk about in the book. Um, obviously, we want limits to worker surveillance. We don't want limitless worker surveillance where the worker is basically just like a serf and, you know, at the beck and call of the employer. Um, on the other hand, if you're somebody who works in the financial sector, by law, you do have more stringent worker surveillance. And there's a good reason for that, right? We want to prevent insider training. We want to prevent things that will, you know, cause the breakdown of our capitalist system, really, right? Um, so we do want to sort of be um, a little more nuanced, right? And thinking about perhaps different sectors of work deserve different type of regulations. Um, and, you know, perhaps there are also certain workers' rights that we want to make universal, right? That we want to make sure everyone has. So, so I do think we want to think through this very thoughtfully. Um, if you don't mind, Dan, I actually had a question for you, Matt, and I, you know, I see we're coming up to the one hour max. So I want to make sure I get to um, discuss this with you. So in the book, I talk about the idea of captured capital, um, which is something actually that came out of reading your work, um, you know, where you talk about data subjects and all the data that's being collected from employees. Um, and with me, I was using the concept of captured capital uh, with the sort of direct, um, direct motive of tackling automation in the workplace. So essentially what, what's happening in many workplaces is the data that's being collected from workers through worker surveillance is the data that will then eventually be used to automate those jobs. So basically you're working to replace yourself in some way, um, but obviously that data is coming from the worker, but it does it belong to the worker? Maybe, maybe not, but should the worker be compensated in some way, right? For that data that's being gathered from them? And could that compensatory uh, scheme be something that actually helps um, when we do transition to automated workplaces. Um, just wanted to hear your thoughts about that, Matt. Yeah, well, and again, I think you, you really build nicely on a lot of what Cindy Eslin has said in this area about automation and, and the, the fear of, of being replaced. Is it different this time, right? It's something obviously we've worried about since even before the Industrial Revolution, but certainly after it. Um, yeah, no, and I, I think that's a, a really something that I really was uh, appreciative of and really excited about it. At, 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 at the end of the book, you talk about this interest in getting workers involved, really. And that's something that I think is really important, um, uh, whether it be through a union or through yeah. um, individual data rights at, at the employment level or through corporate governance, right? Yeah. Um, you're seeing um, more concern about worker participation um, through ESG investment funds and um, the, the advocates for those funds. Um, I think, and, and, and you also, I think when you're talking about this technology, you talk about the alienation, right? right, and I think right. The alienation really comes in, in large part, as, again, as you masterfully point out, from this lack of control, right? Um, it's one thing if I am monitoring myself or I'm, I, there's a group of us who are like, hey, let's see how we're doing. It's another thing if there's like some entity that I have no connection with Mm -hmm. and feel very disconnected from and, and, and powerless in, in the face of that entity, right. you know, taking in all this data and then, you know, using it. Um, and that's, I think, um, what we really have to worry about. And I think your 
you're really right to be both optimistic about the possibilities of the data, but also very concerned about how this data could be misused and really, uh, you know, opportunistically used to, like you say, ultimately replace the workers um, using data that they've created. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good, we're, we're, we're almost at, uh, you know, nearing the end of the hour. Uh, so um, I, I think this is a good point to stop, although I think we could keep going. There's so many more issues to discuss. Um, and I really urge you to, if you want uh, to learn more, uh, get this book. Uh, there's a great discussion about the video interviewing, personality testing, uh, all the different mechanisms of surveillance that workers are being subjected to. Um, one, you know, really challenging issue is is consent because you know employers can readily exact consent, coerce it, uh, and there's very little protection against uh, you know how much pressure uh, employers can put on employees to consent to various types of surveillance and tracking and, you know, even, uh, you know, forcing them to consent to giving up information for the purpose of hiring. How much information are you entitled to know uh, and have about someone when you want to hire them? Um, all of which, you know, the law partially uh, addresses in some contexts like, you know, disabilities, uh, the, the ADA, uh, but not in a lot of other contexts where, you know, a lot of data can be gathered about people um, uh, you know, who are, are being hired in the process of being applying or after being hired. Uh, and I think the law is going to have to draw some some lines. And I think that some things are going to have to be restricted or banned. Uh, but the law is going to have to work, a, I think, a pretty heavy hand uh, in this area to, to, to get control over the situation. Because of what, what's so hard is, you know, the employer has so much more power than the employees. Uh, and that trend, I think, is, is, is moving more uh, toward the employer than the employees as unions are, are dwindling in their power uh, these days. Uh, so I think the trend is, you know, that, you know, that, that we're going to need the law to step in to help empower the employees and protect them, uh, as you know, employers are you know you know gaining the uh, gaining even a stronger hand in, in this process. Um, thank you all for uh, a really interesting discussion. I wish we could go longer, um, and I urge everyone to uh, grab a copy of uh, Ifama's book and also read uh, some of the fabulous scholarship by. Uh, Pauline and Matt, um, really great stuff and uh, really essential uh, for understanding this area and this field. So um, thank you all for your great work and for joining us and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.